If you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to the book of St. John. I think in all of the writings of the prophets, the writings of the apostles, if you had to look at the beauty of the Word of God, and of course it's made up in many different areas, it's prophecy, it's promise, it's history, it's instruction, and it's comfort. But when you try to look and pull out that which is so beautiful, it just beggars description, you would have to go to the Psalms in the Old Testament, and then in the New, at least to me, you would have to go to the book of John. The, the, the glory, the love of, of this book, it beggars description. Starting with the first word of the first verse in chapter 8, this Mother's Day, uh, there is some argument, it's not as far as I'm concerned, but there's some argument that this eighth chapter, at least down through the eleventh uh, verse, was not in the original manuscripts, but it is in a great deal of the old manuscripts. And when you start looking at manuscripts of antiquity, re referring to the Bible, for some unknown reason they were mostly all in pieces and Entire books were left out of some of them for some reason. So if somebody tries to tell you this story was not in the original text, just ignore what they say. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came down unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And to me, this is the, maybe the most beautiful story in the Bible. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up in himself and said unto them, He that is without sin. And some say in the original Greek, we would have to consult some of these Greek scholars here. I don't know. He that is without this sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And, when, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, and this just might be the most beautiful phrase in the entirety of the Word of God, Neither do I condemn thee, Go and sin no more. Now this latter, this twelfth verse is related to that. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And I want to use for a subject, twice it said that he stooped down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And I want to use for a subject, love letters in the sand. Nashville tries to copy it, but he wrote the first one. Glory. Would you bow your heads, please? Father, in the holy name of Jesus, 
I would ask thy help, thy grace, thine anointing. Make this real to our hearts. Help us to accept this message as we endeavor and attempt to preach it with anticipation, with gladness of heart, thankfulness of soul, and gratefulness of spirit. And I would ask that everyone here would be anointed to hear it. And I would ask it all in the holy name of Jesus, and everyone said amen and amen. I made the statement a moment ago in the reading of this passage that, at least to me, this just might be the singular most beautiful story in the Bible, and yet you, you might think, no, not really. The prodigal would be more lovely, more beautiful. A hundred and one other examples of grace, the healing of Bartimaeus, the cleansing of the leper, on and on. Somehow this one, it's, it, it's too raw, it's too hard-hitting. Bartimaeus was blind. We can, we can sympathize with this. The lepers were helpless. We can sympathize with that. But this woman was guilty. No, you don't really need sympathy with her. You need empathy. Because we are all guilty before God. That's what he proved in that illustration that day. We're all guilty. The book says all have sinned. Now we look at sin differently. I look at my sin different than I look at your sin. If you get mad and throw a fit and ram your fist through the plate glass window, I call it an old rotten low-down temper tantrum, and you ought to have the devil cast out of you. But if I do it, it's just bad nerves. You get my point? We look at some sins and say that, and sins are different. Many are much worse than others. But you make a mistake when you try to think, well, it's not too bad a sin. Even though some are worse than others, all are deadly, damnable, dastardly, and darkened. And this story shows, it shows the condition of the human race you know, you, you can make allowances for a Bartimaeus or for a Jairus's, the death of his daughter or even the lepers, but it's hard to make allowance for this woman. And when I get into this story, it's going to be even harder to make allowance for her. All right. I want to look at three things in this narrative this morning. First of all, Jesus' response to feminine folly. That's a sorry note to start out a Mother's Day message on, isn't it? Jesus' answer to feminine folly. Then we're going to look at Jesus' response to sinful stain. And then we're going to look at Jesus' response to religious regimen. Let's look first of all at this feminine folly. Now, all right. This... This Mother's Day, as you ladies are here and we've honored you, even though conditions are better today in the world for women than they've ever been before because of what Jesus did at Calvary and the resurrection, still woman has always been looked upon in a lesser status than a man. The only liberty that women in the world have today is in Christianity. There's no other liberty anywhere. In the Soviet Union, I was there, I walked their streets, 
women are beasts of burden. Under the Soviet atheistic philosophy, no God, women are a beast of burden. You'll see them on the streets packing rock. You'll see them sweeping the streets. And down through history, women have basically, we don't think of it that way in America, now don't answer me, some of you may, but have always been beasts of burden. When Jesus said to the to, to Peter, James, to Peter and John, when you go down there and you'll see a man with a pitcher of water on his head, the disciples said, what? Men didn't carry pitchers of water on their head. That was a woman's job. In the religions of the world today, women, in, in the Muslim religion, for instance, women are looked at with total suspect. I mean, they, if they really go according to Muslim law, they'll put a veil over their face. They're given precious few liberties. They're shut up in a room. That's one of the reasons today for the mess in Iran. The former Shah tried to open up to Western culture and to give women liberty, and it clamped down like a vice, and you have now what you have there. You can go into culture after culture. In Africa, it's a common thing to see the women with their burdens on their head. Judaism, do you know, listen to this, in ancient Judaistic culture, the Jew, the male Jew, when he got up every morning, thanked God for three things. He thanked God that he wasn't born a, a dog, homosexual. He thanked God he wasn't born a homosexual, a Gentile, or a woman. Now you think of that. In America today, we have the same problem. I'm going to show you how. Our nation is leaving God. Our nation and its educational structure is leaving God. Our nation and its religious structure is leaving God. And whenever you leave God... Freedoms go, because under God, man is special. Under anything other than God, man takes a lesser, lesser, lesser place. Women today in America are used. Now, what do you mean by that, used? The deeper in sin it goes, the woman is the object of it. Turn on your television set if you don't believe it. Click. The woman is undressed. She is looked at as a sex object. It is a sneer. That's what Hollywood, Broadway, and the entertainment industry has given to this nation. Have, I'll ask you this question. Has, have these powers, these centers of entertainment power, projected and presented the home as an American model? No. Have they presented motherhood as, a, as an American model? No. The woman is pictured as, as a piece, piece of goods. Consequently, the feminine gender has become more and more jaded, 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 jaded. Until today, you get in airports here in this country and you get, a, just, you get up close to people, men and women, and you hear, you'll hear the foulest, filthiest language coming from the women as well as the men. I'm going to tell you something else. Satan hates the woman. He hates her with a passion. In this Western culture, he hates woman so much, so much. When you, ne the next time you turn on your TV set, he projects the sensuous, the sexual, the passionate to make her twist and look like a snake. 
Now just think about it. In your Broadway plays, in your Hollywood movies, in your dances, a woman is projected like a snake. And if a man is made to look like that, he's a pervert. He hates women. All right. The only liberation for the woman is in Jesus. Paul said in the gospel there is neither male nor female. When God starts to baptize in the Holy Ghost, he doesn't say, is that a woman? He fills with the Spirit. Glory to God. He will help a woman do anything he'll help a man to do. Jesus broke the barrier. Jesus tore that. You say, well, why was it there to start with? Ah, it was there because of what happened at the beginning. See, Eve fell. And from that moment, woman was looked at as the culprit. She did it. She was the cause. She really wasn't that no count husband of hers was standing looking at her when she did it. And if he had been a man, he would have ruled his house. And Eve wouldn't have been fooling around by that tree. But the rascal missed it. You're getting a little chauvinistic now, Jenny Swagger. I, I like what you said before, the lady said, but you kind of got a little bit off that. No, I didn't get off. Show me a home where a woman rules it, and I'll show you a home where there are problems. I'll admit there may be some women here that have to rule it. You don't have any choice because your husband's not worth shooting. Boy, that's, let's change that. That's, that's, I keep forgetting I'm in a church and not over television. <laughs> let's change it to more proper terminology. He's not adequate. No, that's, that's, a, little bit, that's a little bit strong. Too. Let's don't say it that way. You have to take the leadership because he just won't do it. That's better. The rascal won't do it. But God's method is for the man to be the head of the house. And God's method is for the woman to rule that house under her husband. And Adam wasn't tending to his business. So it really, she fell. She brought it on. But what a lot of people don't know, Adam, if it, if it had stopped there, we wouldn't have had the curse. And the fall would not have resulted. Adam could have said, woman, you get away, even, even though he shouldn't have allowed her to have been, oh, I know that doesn't set well with some of you. But even after she did it, if he had refused to eat of that himself and disobey God, she could have asked forgiveness and the fall would have never had resulted and your sons and daughters would not have been cursed and victims of the fall. But he went ahead and partook with her. All right. Paul, in writing to Timothy, said, what is it, 2 Timothy 2 and 23, 2, 15, whatever it is. He talked about Eve in the fall and he talked about in the preceding verses and then he said, but she shall be saved in childbearing. Now, uh, Bible students are a little bit shaky on what he meant by that. Most agree that he was talking about when she gives birth to a baby that she won't die if she continues in faith and so forth. I've studied it and studied it and read it and read it, but I think it meant more than that because in the preceding verses he was talking about her fall. 
And I believe, even though he may have had that in mind, he also had in mind that through the woman came the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary. You see, get the picture. Satan denigrates woman. Satan hates woman. Satan humiliates her with a hatred, with a venom that is still manifest today. Conversely, God Almighty elevated woman by using, he could have done it many ways, but by using woman to bring the Redeemer into the world, the greatest honor that had ever been placed upon any human being, man or female. Give the Lord a hand. Now, you've got Jesus. The great feast has just closed. In the seventh chapter, it, that, that's that great, great passage that the choir number was built on this morning. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. The day ends, the next morning he goes into the temple and they bring this woman. And I'm going to tell you some things about her in a little bit, but not, not at the moment. They bring this woman, and they, they do not just march her in, they treat her like she's a piece of dirt. And in their minds, they have the right to do it because of what she's been caught in. They bring this woman and they don't march her up and stand her there. They just, and she's a girl, maybe 18, 19, 20 years old. They just throw her before him and she falls on the ground. Would you get that air turned down a little bit, please? And they say, and they've got him now. The law of Moses said, Master, they call him Master, the bunch of hypocrites. They said, what are you going to do? She was caught in the very act. I don't mean hearsay, a rumor. I mean she was caught in the act. And I'll mention that a little more in a moment. I hadn't figured out yet how they caught her. Have you noticed? Have you noticed when it comes to adultery, they never catch women, they catch men? I I'm serious. I've never heard of a woman being caught in my life. She may be implicated with a man, but it's always a man that's caught. If he's so clumsily dumb, he gets caught. But this woman was... <laughs> Y'all are thinking that one through, aren't you? But just stop. Just stop and think about it. Every time I hear of a preacher caught, they never mention a woman. I don't know who she is. But it's always a man. Have you heard? But they caught this woman. I wonder why they didn't bring the scoundrel with her. I wonder why. In this whole scenario, there is, the, there is the picture of a plot. I won't get involved in it because we don't know. But they, they caught her in the act. And man, that's all that bunch of, of uh, carnivorous rascals, won't it? We got her now. They could not care less about her. We're going to use her to get at him. And they throw her down and she's lying there on the ground. You talk about guilty, friend. There's no excuse. The best lawyer in the world couldn't have helped her. Except one. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. They didn't know it. But they had just hired for her the best attorney the world has ever known. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My Lord, 
We got her now. We got you now. But you talk about Oh, he's the one that defends me. He's the one that pleads my case. Oh, old split foot, still dragging up. And Jesus steps up. My, my, my. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Sinner friend, you can have him as your lawyer if you want him. You can have him as your attorney, as your barrister if you want him, as your legal counsel. But she's guilty. She's caught in the act. They've got, they've got Polaroid pictures of her. And they said, now Moses said, Stoner, what do you say? He reaches down. Writes on the ground. Holy Spirit never, never told us what he wrote. I'm going to ask him when I get there. I want to know what he wrote. But I know a little bit of what he wrote. I don't know what he wrote, but I know a little bit of what he wrote. I know what he didn't write. You can learn a lot of things about what is, but by what ain't. He didn't write judgment on the ground. He didn't write hell on the ground. He didn't write condemned on the ground. <laughs> Glory to God. He didn't write caught you goody goody on the ground. He didn't write you had it now, honey. He didn't write that on the ground. I don't know what he wrote, but I know what he didn't write. And then he said the most beautiful words that's ever been uttered. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. All right, now I've got something to say about that. When he said that, here's a woman on the ground. But when he said, neither do I condemn thee, he settled the issue of the problem of the feminine gender from Eve forever with that word. Woman had walked under a load, guilty, looked at as a piece of cheap goods. You did it. But with that pronouncement, Jesus said, you lift your head up. Don't let the world condemn you. Forget those things which are behind. All the way from Eve, neither do I condemn thee. Glory to God. Do you get that? Do you understand that? With one pronouncement, with one love letter in the sand, he set the human race free in the feminine gender which would culminate in Calvary and the resurrection. Give the Lord a hand. <laughs> glory, 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 glory. Does that hit you like it hits me? Women, you don't have to say, well, you don't, because you're li living in a Western culture, which is a, which is a product of, of, of hundreds of years of, of, of Christianity. Lord, if I was before a television camera, I would tell that 134 nations that the telecast is aired in. Women, you don't have to bow over. You don't have to slink. You don't have to be guilty. Jesus liberated you. Not Mohammed, not Karl Marx, not V.I. Lennon, but Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, sets you free. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. All right. Does he condone sin? Let's look at, that's his response to the feminine folly. Let's look at to the response to sinful stain. Now, does he condone sin? 
Does he? Does he gloss over sin? The opposite. Now here's what I want you to look at about this woman. I don't know about you, but I thought all my life, man, they caught her in the act. So she, she must have been a, a woman of loose morals. She must have been uh, maybe a prostitute, a harlot, a harlot. She must have been. I've never really thought about it too much, but just in my mind, brethren, I thought the woman just, I meant, you know, to let herself get caught. So she must have been loose living, just had gone to the bottom, the depths. They didn't care. She was a prostitute. She, but, but when I started studying it and looking into it and going down to the roots of it, that's not what she was. She was probably very young, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, probably. Secondly, she had been a virgin before this act. And then the worst thing of it all, she was a betrothed bride. Now, engagement doesn't mean much now, but in those days, whenever a man and a woman were engaged to be married, an engagement was the same thing as marriage. They didn't live together until they were married, but as far as the law of the land was concerned, you were married. You didn't look at anybody else, and it used to be that way even when I was a kid here in this country. But it's fallen by the wayside now because marriage doesn't mean much anymore except to God. And Moses' law, that's the reason they hit him with that law. Moses' law in Deuteronomy 22 and 23 specifically. Let's read it. Let's go over here and read it. Deuteronomy 22, 23. It says, Twenty-third verse, Deuteronomy. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed to an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, or remember she's engaged to be married and she's a virgin, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not being in the city. In other words, when it talks about the city, it means she, she, she could have helped it because people are all around her and she could have screamed for help. That's what it's talking about. And the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife to be, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. Now that's, that's what those scribes, now, there were scribes and Pharisees mixed up in this condemnatorial bunch. See? All right. Now, let, let me tell you something else. You see, they knew he claimed to be the Messiah. They knew that. That's the reason the scribes were with the Pharisees. The scribes were, were really the, the, the interpreters of the law. They were geniuses, supposedly, allegedly, in the law. And they knew that, that let, let me, well, let me read to you what, uh, what they knew and what he was coming to fulfill. Deuteronomy 18 and 15. All right. You see, Moses gave the law that I read to you just a moment ago. If this, this lady, is, this girl is a virgin, she's engaged to be married, and she commits adultery, kill her. Kill him too. Kill both of them. Stone them. All right. Jesus says, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one Moses prophesied about. And others. Fifteenth verse, it said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. Moses is saying this, see. He prophesied it about 15, 1600 years before Jesus came. 
The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. And unto him ye shall hearken. So they had sewed up their, their pl plot very well because if he was like Moses, which he was confessing to be, he's backed into a corner, he's got a killer. See, he has no alternative or choice. All right. His answer to them was this. And you can visualize them standing there looking at this scenario. He said, after he rode on the ground, and they just kept asking him, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What is your answer? Here she is. There's no doubt about her guilt. What do you do? He said, he that is without this sin, or he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now really what he was saying, he was saying to you men that are here, whether you've committed adultery or not, if you've ever had it in your heart, you're guilty. And let the one, let the one that has never had an adulterous thought pick up the first stone. She's on the ground right there. You can't miss her. And throw it at her. It got just as quiet there as it is here. I can, uh, I can hear old brother Jedekiah scribe. He says to old brother Ezekiel nearby says, Hey, Ezekiel, um, I think my wife wants me at home. I've got to go. Brother Ezekiel says, yeah, I think I've got to leave too. I believe we'll go on now. And they sneaked off. They sneaked off like cur dogs. They did. And they were left with no one but Jesus and the woman. And misery looks up at pity. And he said to her, this is his response to sin. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's his response to your sin. Okay, now I'm going to, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to close this message. And I want to get to the last thing. Jesus' response to religious regimen. Judaism was a religion. Mos the, the Muslim religion is a religion. Buddhism is a religion. Confucianism is a religion. Hinduism is a religion. Zillion others. There is no love in religion. There is absolutely no love in religion. The ally of the or Ali, of the Mohammed religion, has no love. In the Quran, there is no love. Only harsh, cold, brutal law. Okay. In the Old Testament, when you think of God, what do you think of? Now, just, just wait a minute. In your mind right now, I've got just a few minutes. In your mind, I want you to think of God. God. What do you think of? Is there a little fear there? 
Do you think of such might and majesty and power that it's awesome? And do you kind of want to do that? Now, you may not, but brother, I do. When I think of God, man, Do you know what Jesus said in John? He said, no man hath seen God at any time. He wasn't meaning with an eye because Moses ate with him. Joshua saw him. Abraham saw him. Daniel saw him. What it, was, is it a contradiction? No, the word seen meaning comprehended. No man hath comprehended God. But then he went on to say that he, the word, declared him. What are you getting at? I'm getting at this. Every symbol under the old Judaistic law, every single symbol pointed to the one that would reveal God, Jesus Christ. You can't see God without seeing Jesus. You've got to see God through Jesus. Philip said, show us the Father. He said, Philip, I've been so long with you and you don't even know me. You can't see God until you see Jesus. And when you, when, you, when you revert your attention from what you kind of imagine God is to Jesus, then the picture changes, doesn't it? You see mercy. You see healing. You see love. And Jesus said, God's not what you thought he is, a hard testmaster to smash. God is love. God is mercy. God is compassion. God is love. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Hallelujah. I don't have to hide my face from God because I've accepted Jesus. Hallelujah. Religions are cold. All right, point number two. Oh, I've got to hurry. Religion has, religion has rules, all kind of rules. If you join a Mormon church, you've got to obey a, 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 a jillion rules. It's religion. I saw a big building in, in Los Angeles the other day, Beverly Hills, big Mormon temple. You can't get in there unless you have reached a certain state in Mormonism. They won't even let you in, walk in the door. You got me? Catholicism is a mixture of Christianity and, and religion. And it negates Christianity because Christianity has no rules. None. None. No rules. Ah, now you, you don't know what you're talking about. Our, oh, our church? Yeah, I know churches have rules, but Christianity doesn't have any. When I was a little boy, to join our church, you had to sign a paper after you read it. I won't smoke, dip, cuss, or chew. <laughs> Number two, I, <laughs> I won't go to the show. <laughs> I won't. I won't go to nightclubs. I won't go to this. I won't go to that. I won't go to that. We had it all in. You had to sign it. You couldn't get in. And if you, when you signed it and got in, you felt good. Man, I've, I've, man I've, I've kept the rules. So what did you have? You had a room full of hypocrites. What are you talking about, Jimmy Swear? You preach against all those things. Yeah, but, but, but listen to me. You, you, can, you can, I preach against going to the movies, but you can never go to a movie. I preach against cursing, but you can never curse. I preach against drinking, but you can never take a drink. I preach against nightclubs, and you can never have even seen a nightclub. None of that. I can tell you how to do it. Easy. Oh. <laughs> Lock them up in a jail cell from their time at that high. Lock them up. We'll make good Christians out of them. Lock them up. Look through the bars. No, that's religion. Because you can do all of those, or not do any of those things and still be a walking devil. 
because what we're talking about is not a system of rules. It's from the heart, the heart, the heart, the heart. The new covenant doesn't give rules. It gives direction. Direction. If I could, if, if I had the power, God help me, I don't want it, and he never will give it to anybody. If I could just walk right up and say, zip, and pull open his heart. I'm choosing carefully who I pick. <laughs> zip, and show his heart. And I could look in and see what you do and what you think. You see, because the, 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 the doing comes a whole lot after the thinking of it. It comes here first. Jesus said, you're walking around here, you, you priests and you Pharisees and you scribes like you're somebody. And more, you're boasting. But if you look at a woman, the lust after her, you have committed adultery already in your heart. That's what he said. So when God washes you and cleanses you, it's not an exterior washing. It's a cleansing of the heart. And then if you sin against him, he said, go and sin no more. Don't you do it. The sin will destroy you. It'll put you on the ground just like it did her. It, it'll put you smack on the ground. He doesn't throw you over and kick you out. He picks you up if you'll let him and love you and says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And that's the reason without machine guns or without rules or without religion, Christianity is the most powerful force in the world today because it's guided by love. Hallelujah. Okay, give me, give me five minutes and I'm quitting. We received a letter some months ago from a woman. It was concerning a message I'd preached on Friday night in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This was about two years ago. And I remembered the message. I remember God dealing with me about it. I remembered vividly. It's like it's just imprinted on my mind. I remember what happened the afternoon before the service that night. I remember the flow of the Spirit. I preached on the subject, and that's insignificant, but four women of the gospel had to do with women. And it was a plan of redemption brought out of it. She wrote me. She said, Brother Swaggart, I sat in front of the television set when that message started. And there has never been a harder person than I. And a woman, when she goes to the bottom, can get much harder than a man. She said, I had gone to the depths. My father was a preacher. He molested me when I was a child. He would preach at night and come in, and when I was 10, 11, 12, 14, climb in the bed with me. Month after month, year after year, until I finally left home. And when I left home, I was a wreck. I was destroyed. Totally destroyed. She said, I hated men. She said, I became an alcoholic, a drug addict, a prostitute. I hated men. I hated women worse than men, worse than men. And I hated God. She said, a festering, burning hate. And I was nothing. She said, nothing. I had gone through several marriages. This one was on the rocks. And she said that program came on. 
And she said, when it ended, and it ended with this story, the woman on the ground. And when you said the words, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. It hit me. And for the first time, I saw God. She said, it's taken, it's taking time. But healing started immediately when the blood covered the stain. And I called my daddy. He's old in years now, and I hadn't seen him in years. And I hated him. I hated him. But she said, the day I called him, and said he broke when he heard my voice. She said, I said, Daddy, I forgive you in Jesus, and I love you. And she said, when I said it, it broke. The whole hate and guilt and pain and sickness and sorrow broke. The Bible stops with Jesus saying this to this woman, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. I don't know what happened to her. I can imagine what happened. I can't believe that she wandered away and gave him scant attention thereafter. I believe she lived for him diligently the rest of her life. And when God mended the broken vessel, I don't know. But if she later had her husband, had a husband and children, and I believe she did, the children, having heard of Jesus, must have asked her, Did you know him? Mommy, did you see him? She wouldn't have told those kids the story. She would not have related to protect their little hearts from what really happened. But a faraway look would have come in her eyes. And she would have said, yes. I saw it. Mommy, you mean you saw it? Yes, I saw it. How close were you to him? She couldn't tell them if it actually happened. How close she really was. But she would have said, I was close enough to touch him. And let me tell you, the look that was in his eyes. He is the Savior of the world. He saved your mother. <laughs> Neither do I condemn thee. Precious words divine. Fallen from the lips of mercy like the sweetest chimes. Neither do I condemn thee. Say them o'er and o'er. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We celebrate Mother's Day because of him. Hallelujah. And you are special because he uttered those words. And he died on Calvary and rose from the dead. Would you bow your heads, please?